Good morning. I'm Corey Laszlo. Today I'm going to talk to you a bit about my path, my passion for Android, and also my passion for emerging markets. So I've played with a lot of different technologies, but found myself in Android a few years ago, right before that I was an iOS developer. Don't tell anyone. Um, but the reason that I really got passionate about Android is it's just something that's always been accessible to the world over. It's something that everyone in the world, not everyone, but soon everyone will be able to afford. A lot better than an iPhone, for example. It's available to the, the entire world, not just the richest. So that's the important bit for me. I've always been working in bridging the digital divide since I was in college. Uh, usually I did domestic things, but I started expanding that globally in 2014 when I joined an organization called Kids on Computers. So there we went to Mexico on the one trip I joined them, and we installed uh, computer labs in uh, basically schools. And then also, besides creating new ones, we went and visited old ones. You could see the impact that technology was having year over year on the students and the global and the community as well. They knew that we were connecting them globally and they were very excited to have us. So now my passion is my day job. So I've always cared about sustainability, but I never thought it was something I could really do with my career. But now both are joined together in this one um, place that I'm working. So it's called Off Grid Electric. We're installing solar in small villages in Africa. So what's really cool about that is that we are enabling students to read at night, for example, or people to create businesses off of charging cell phones, and we'll talk about that in the battery section, or, you know, doing things like creating a barbershop. We work in a network and uh, battery-constrained environment, too. So one thing you have to think about the battery there is we don't have electricity everywhere to charge it. So it's not only, oh, it ran out today and that really sucks. It's a problem. You have to find somewhere to be able to charge that phone. And it's really bright sunshine in Tanzania where we um, are operating now. It will be eventually all of Africa. So it really uses up a lot of the brightness and the um, battery because of that. But... Apps and um, smartphones, really in less than a decade, have become completely indispensable to our modern lives. There's an app for everything. If you leave it at home for um, some reason, then you just feel like there's a ghost phone. You're worried that you're missing all these different messages. It's just something you can't live without anymore. But it's only nine years ago that the iPhone created an app store, and then eight years ago that we had Google Play. Before that, OEMs came with pre, uh, basically forced you to write applications for their specific phones. It wasn't really easy to make those portable to move to different devices. So it was really locked in, and it really constrained developers and what they could be able to do. But now, by 2020, the global app market is going to be worth $102 billion sold each year. So that's up from $53 billion in 2012. That's pretty ridiculous, actually. Just think about what the opportunity is that this represents. This simply wasn't possible before those platforms were developed. This is a huge possibility that you can take advantage of and be uh, a part of as it grows. 83% of phones right now in the world are Android devices. 83%. The overwhelming majority of phones in the world are Androids. There's 2 billion in circulation now, and there's another 5 billion, 6 billion people that could have phones over time. Last year alone, there were 65 million at billion apps that were downloaded. Now, in the next decades, most of that growth is going to be in emerging markets. We're already pretty saturated in the developed world. So countries like Brazil, India, China... That's where you're going to see most of the growth. And a lot of our applications don't really serve their needs right now. We assume that there's a lot of data, a lot of power. We just do whatever we want and assume that they'll be able to run it. But that's not true in these countries, at least not yet. Hopefully in the coming years that will also be not a constraint we'll have to deal with anymore. One of the major drivers here is that Android devices are cheap. They are, on average, half the price of an iPhone device. But, um, as you know, on the um, cheaper end, there are much more affordable options. There's a $50 phone in South Africa, and now we're trending towards a $30 phone. It's also important to note that um, data access is now expanding. So in Kenya and Nigeria, for example, they went from 4% coverage to now 25% coverage. And that's just going to keep um, increasing. That was six-fold 
um, change in just three years. Basically, this means that more people will have access to our applications than ever before. We'll have the opportunity to impact billions of people's lives, one app and one life at a time. Soon, you'll be able to reach nearly everybody on the planet with Android apps. So today, we're going to talk through some of the technical challenges that you're going to encounter, as well as some of the design challenges you need to think through. And finally, I'll give you a framework for thinking of your apps whenever you're writing for the global stage. So let's talk about design first. As you know, design plays an integral role in, the, in every application. But in addition to the normal things you have to think about, now you have to think about a resource-constrained environments. So they don't have a lot of electricity. They don't have a lot of um, coverage on digital and um, different cultural things. So if you think about our lives, we're typically well-paid. Uh, we have a global network, might have gone to college, but that's not true of the global user. So you can't really extrapolate your experience to your users throughout the world. You need to develop empathy through understanding where they're coming from and what they're experiencing. And I'll tell you a little bit uh, in a bit how to think through those types of things. One of the challenges is going to be literacy. So although it's growing pretty rapidly, it's 90% um, literate populations in um, South America and uh, Europe and Asia. But it's only about 50% in African countries, and there's still 40% of illiterate adults in India. So that's somewhere that you need to think through. You can't just slap some uh, internationalization on it and say, okay, great, it's accessible everywhere. You need to think through flows and making sure that your user can progress through the application in a way that makes sense to them. For example, at Off Grid Electric, we have, um, for the people who are installing and maintaining the solar systems, they have usually a sixth or seventh grade application, I mean, um, education. But our sales officers, they usually have something more like college education. So we, even with our application, have a wide variety of users that we are servicing with one application. So one thing that uh, at least I was taken for granted until I went to Mexico and saw how hard it was to teach a child how to double click a mouse. Uh, but basically, we have a tech background that has been slowly evolving. New things come out. We just adapt to them. For example, I had computers in um, elementary school and middle school and stuff. And then I got a pager. And then I got a PDA. And then I got an MP3 player. Eventually, I got a cell phone. Eventually, a smartphone that smashed all those things together. But this was just a slow evolution. Solution, as new things came out, that made sense, so I'll get rid of these three devices, but they haven't seen this evolution. So they are starting at a very different place than we are. And that's something we need to make sure we don't take for granted. Just because we have learned user interface patterns doesn't mean they're going to directly apply to new populations that we're trying to serve. For a lot of people in the world, their first computer is going to be a smartphone and their first access to the internet is going to be over cellular towers instead of through um, dial-up internet or whatever. So um, the concept of human-centered design is just basically using the ideas of getting close feedback and figuring out what your users are doing by researching them, iterating, and figuring out what the best design is that will serve all your users. Now, that's going to be hard because you are probably far away from them geographically. So if they're on the other side of the word, world, it's going to be a little bit harder to get that tight feedback loop. You can't stuff them in a room, ask them a bunch of questions, and hope they're going to tell you exactly what you need to know to make that UI the best. So how do we do that if we can't really see them struggle? Frankly, there's no, um, you know, it's nothing you can really do instead of direct travel that will have as much impact on you. Um, so if you can travel, arrange a trip for your team, I absolutely suggest that. It really helps to open your eyes to the daily frustrations that you're going to see. So Facebook and Instagram um, have done this in the past. So what they did is they found out that they bought local phones, they bought local plans, and they found out that their app was really not fun in these areas. So they came back and directly applied those learnings and uh, made the app a lot better. But then the next year, they also made Facebook Lite, where it's now it's one megabyte, runs on 2G networks, and uses far less data than the normal Facebook application does. So 
So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my experience in the field. So last November, I spent a month in Arusha, Tanzania. So this is where my company is based. And I basically wanted to observe the app and its natural habitat, figure out what's happening, see what happens when people are using the app, where it falls down, where it works great. Sadly, it didn't really work great anywhere. So we're working on that now. But you know when you go that it's, okay, well, I'm not going to have great data and I'm not going to really have power, but you don't really feel it until you actually have to experience it yourself. So we went on a service call. Um, so basically there were two houses. We started, the first one was about an hour and a half drive from the office. So we start driving on these tiny little roads. They're really bumpy. This is the rainy season, so it's raining a lot. Roads keep getting washed out. Uh, the first house was pretty easy to find. It was mostly on the main road. We just went, checked their system. Everything was great. But the second one, we had to go through many, many roads. Everything kept getting washed out. There were gullies where there used to be roads. Um, luckily, some people were on the road, and we could ask them for directions. Um, so there were motorcycle riders or picky-picky riders that we could ask them, oh, well, this person and this rough GPS location, how do I get there? So they helped us find these houses. But the GPS wasn't super accurate whenever we record it. So it was just kind of a guessing game finding um, the people on the map. Because you can't just use Google Play. You can't just use Google Maps, by the way. There's no addresses really in Tanzania. And if it gives you directions, it's more like turn left in 50 feet. It doesn't really give you a lot to work with. But basically, we went through and we fixed the issue at the second house. When it was time to go, we were about to say, okay, great, I am done with this task. Please mark it as done. The app didn't work. So there was no data. So they had a call that required the server to give us an answer before we could move on. Obviously, this is not an ideal situation. So they had to call into the main office and say, oh, I'm done with this task. Can you please mark it as complete? So that's the type of thing that they had to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis in the field. But when it was time to finish and come home, uh, there was this humongous storm. Like, it was really orange underneath the huge, crazy clouds. So basically, it was picking up tons of dust, and it was like this rain stand storm. It was really kind of scary, actually. But so we're driving back on these roads. They're washing out more and more. We're basically slip sliding in the mud. Uh, I thought the driver was just having fun at first, but he was not. Like when I got out of the car, it was like I, I actually fell. Um, but yeah, so it, it was pretty intense. So eventually we get stuck and we can't move anymore. Cause like what we had done is got out, pushed the van for a bit. It would go for a little bit further, get stuck again. Um, but eventually we were stuck, stuck and we needed to get the farmers nearby to help us with their tractor. So they uh, hooked us up to the tractor, but like drag, drug us over a tree, uh, a small tree, but it was still a tree. And eventually they got us to like the gravel area so we could get home. But that was quite the adventure. We left at 8 a.m. in the morning. We didn't get back till after 9 p.m. And we only saw two houses that day. But if you think about it, that's a special day for me because I'm visiting, but that might be a daily encounter for them. So what if you can't travel? Well, you can try and connect with the local populations. So one of the things you can leverage, there's a global um, Google developer group um, network, basically. So you probably know of the GDGs in your area, but you can reach out to them in different areas that you want to make and you want to serve. And you can be like, hey, so I've got this application. I'd like to get some feedback, please. And maybe you could get, do a tech talk. So then you set up this win-win situation where you can get what you need from local people and then they can get what they need as well, which is bringing them up technology-wise. You can also find local contractors to either be QA engineers or even if you wanted to hire someone in that country, you could have them develop with you as well and then go out into the field and give you feedback. So basically the idea with feedback is you're trying to find a goal at the end. You're triangulating somewhere. But you can't just always assume the old patterns that have worked in the past are going to work now. And outside of that, you also have to make sure that you are taking away the right things from feedback because it can be really tricky. In one case, we have this, um, basically it's a presentation, a paper presentation people are showing. So we were trying to replace that digitally. 
So we sent people in the field to observe sales officers using it, seeing what works, what doesn't. Um, but they were using it very highly all the time. They're talking through the thing. Turns out, though, in their day-to-day, they don't actually use it. But because somebody was watching them, they were doing the right things. So we took away a completely different set of learnings than we probably should have because we didn't realize that that was happening at the time. So you have to make sure that your experiments make sense and that they isolate some things that, you know, might mess it up. You can also set up your own lab environment with using uh, different emulators and things like that. It's the lowest barrier to entry. You can also buy some cheap devices and try to get low data plans. And then do things like simulating low um, storage space on the device. So um, this is pretty common in the U.S. I'm sure it happens here, too. How many times have you been like, oh, my gosh, this person is an idiot. What are they doing with my application? Well, you really need to drop that mentality because it's probably your fault that it wasn't immediately accessible to them. You wrote something that people just didn't understand. Does that mean you're superior to them like no it's not like they just didn't get it because you thought it made sense but it didn't okay so you need to be able to create a globally accessible design that's our goal here a well-designed app should really bring us together instead of separating us so now that we talked about some of the design challenges let's talk a little bit about technology so we tend to assume that we have the best um well We actually do assume we have the best because we have the fastest phones usually. We have um, good Wi-Fi. We have access to data. We don't really think about what it's like for other people. So when we're building these applications, we're doing it on our fast phones. We won't notice the uh, performance glitches, for example, because you won't see it because our phone is fast enough. So how do you find out? You need to find out what they're experiencing day to day because it's most likely opposite in emerging markets. And now keep in mind that tuning your experience for emerging markets is not going to, um, is not just for them. It's for everyone. Every time you make the app better, it's really going to serve all of your users. So one of the three major challenges that we're going to talk about in the tech realm is the devices themselves. Usually they're pretty cheap, they're small, they have very small screens. I don't know if you've used like a Samsung Pocket before. They're adorable, but there's not a lot of screen real estate there. So you really need to think about how your apps are going to work on these different devices. Now, there's Android One, which may or may not go somewhere. We'll see. There's some mixed reviews right now. But basically the idea behind Android One is that they create a reference framework that will have things like all-day battery and dual SIMs and the ability to get the latest OS devices as soon as they come out. So if this takes off, this could actually help us with a lot of these technical challenges that we're dealing with today. But you should really assume that you're still dealing with the lower-end devices when you are tuning your performance. So to be a better uh, developer for the phone, just make sure that you're doing things like profiling your memory um, and finding any leaks that might be there and finding any performance improvements that you can find. There's a lot of tooling around that that will help you. And then you might want to do things like speeding up your application starts or at least showing a splash screen so they know that what's happening behind there is you're not just totally stuck. Show them something. And that speaks to perceived performance. If you're touching the device, you want them to feel like something is happening. So make sure that you deal with touch devices, uh, touch uh, events and things like that pretty quickly, even if it's going to take a while for it to finish that particular action. One of the major culprits in um, doing this is like showing images, downloading images. So make sure that the images that you do have, you actually need, or that you could use things like WebP or SVGs instead of a bunch of pings. Just do anything that you can to try and reduce the amount of burden on this device. Ah, the age-old question, should I take it off the shelf or ride it myself? Well, in general, you kind of want to limit your dependencies so that your APK is smaller. But that said, you don't want to write everything from scratch either. So there are a lot of great um, libraries out there right now that have really good unit test coverage. If you forked it and did whatever you wanted to do to it, then you're going to have to maintain that over the long haul. So that could be detrimental, especially if you're not writing more unit tests around the stuff that you're changing. The cost of rewriting might be a lot higher. 
And like I said, there's a lot of maintenance costs that are included with that. So just make sure that when you're looking at these dependencies, finding out do they really serve you more than um, they hurt you. So are they, uh, what do they include? What other libraries are they pulling in? What do they really do for you? So um, you probably have APKs a little bit bigger than 10 megabytes, but this seems to be the sweet spot. Um, so Google has this talk called Building for Billions that they just uh, released fairly recently. They also have this whole fact sheet behind it, too, that gives you a lot more detail about how you can do the sorts of things I'm talking about in my talk here. But basically, they said that about 10 megabytes is the cutoff point for people. If it's that or smaller, people will download it. If it's bigger, then they might never get it at all. At OGE, Off Grid Electric, we keep it around two megabytes right now. But we have a rich media application also, and that one we do as a separate tablet APK. So you can use tablet APKs and different APKs and stuff to segment it to make sure that you're serving all the people that you need to with the applications that you're creating. So this used to be a pretty big uh, limitation for emerging markets. The lowest that you could um, pay for a particular item, either a subscription or a purchase, was $1. So they just recently changed this, and they, I think they announced it in that Building for Billions talk that I mentioned earlier. But basically now you can do um, purchases in the local currency. But when it was 99 cents, that might be a significant portion of their income. So they're not going to buy your application if it basically means they can't eat as much that week. You also might want to think about reducing your price in those emerging markets so that you can bring more people online. So if you reduce your price by 50 cents but you get 5 billion more users, I mean, the math could work out there. So make sure that you're looking at those sorts of options. Now, speaking of data, um, basically, most of the users in the rest of the world don't really have the access that we do. They might be traveling from village to village and don't have full coverage. It's usually about spotty at best. Even in developed nations, a lot of times, I'll run into pretty bad network here and there. And it's actually pretty expensive. So Google found that about 10% of emerging market um, income goes to data purchasing. It's about 2 to 4% for the U.K. and the U.S., but it's 10% of their income goes to data in uh, emerging markets. So that's a pretty significant chunk, so don't waste their money. We're pretty privileged in both the U.S. and the Europe because we have ubiquitous access to data, and we also have Wi-Fi to offset our data usage, unless you... For, like for me, for some reason, Snapchat is just completely going wild and has uh, taken up all the data in my plan this month before I even came to Berlin. So I already came in a constrained environment. So I've had like 2G most of the time, which is not fun. But that is something that people experience a lot more often. And when I was in Mexico a few years ago, I bought one of those tiny little phones and basically I opened up Instagram and all my data was gone. So then I had to go buy more data and I had just spent money on it. So you want to make sure that you're not doing that sort of stuff to your users. Basically, assume they don't have data all the time, because that's pretty important. Um, when you're thinking about the data, minimize the fetching that you need to do. There are probably things they can do offline where they don't need constant interaction with the server. Make sure to give them a meaningful experience, though, as well. Think through the things that you are bundling uh, and, well, think through things you could bundle with your APK instead of downloading it directly all the time. Do things like using SVGs and XMLs to create um, images instead of doing these large PNGs and stuff. So make sure that um, you're thinking about things offline first. So at OGE, like I mentioned, our app didn't work very well. They had to call in the center to finish their tasks, which they should be able to just say, I'm done, and leave and go home. But they weren't able to do that. So what we're doing when we um, do design, we did some um, HCI, human center um, uh, stuff. We went and watched people doing different tasks. We did a bunch of research. We came into a design. But now, while I'm working through those designs, I'm like, oh, well, that requires me to go to the server and get a, um, a key back. So let's try and change that. So that's how we're thinking through the designs and making sure that each thing, the implications of each thing in that design, don't actually mean that you have to be online to be able to finish a task. 
You can do things like using job uh, queues and um, caching aggressively to make sure that you are managing um, the data that needs to be uh, synced later with the server. There's things like Firebase, which I'm not allowed to use right now, but I want to. It seems really cool um, to be able to use that to manage most of the database back and forth. Um, but that's one of the things that when you go offline, it just keeps it locally, and then eventually it's going to sync it for you. Now, finally, let's talk about the battery a bit. So imagine you're living in a rural village. You have to walk about an hour to the latest, to the closest electrified village because you don't have solar in your home, for example. You might have to go there, wait for it to charge, if that's possible. If not, then you would drop it off, and then you'd have to go back at some point. So you might be wasting up to like four hours or so just to get the one charge on your phone. And you know how quickly that charge goes. So you don't want to make it so that your applications basically drain the battery of everyone. Like basically Snapchat, I don't know what it's doing, but it is completely making my phone burn up. It's so hot. So I know that it's working high. It's at the list of using the most data and using the most battery. So. But outside of the time that they need to invest to charge their phones, they also need to pay often to charge it because if they don't have, either they have to pay for their electricity or they have to pay when they go charge it somewhere else. Now, if we were to develop a battery that lasts, let's say, for a week, that would unlock a humongous segment. But we should really be thinking that uh, we need to manage it ourselves for now. So make sure that you still are not wasting the battery. Even if we do have this panacea in the future, it would be good to make sure that you are managing the battery responsibly. Yeah, do things like look at your network consumption, look at your battery, I mean, sorry, your uh, GPS usage. Make sure that the things that you're doing make a lot of sense. Don't make all these mindless calls to the back end for a heartbeat or for um, saying, hey, do I have some new data I can go fetch? Think through ways so that you can make sure that your app isn't always waking up the device and wasting all that battery. So the Android platform made this a focus uh, with Project Volta, which was part of Lollipop. So basically, they um, gave us APIs that help us batch schedule stuff, so that's the job scheduler. And then they backported that through the GCM Network Manager. So that's one thing I'd suggest you take a look at if you're interested in doing um, this offline queuing sort of stuff. But that requires the developers to actually think through stuff. And I don't know how many people in here have done it, um, but we haven't. Well, we've actually been working on it now. But in my previous applications, we hadn't used this at all yet. Uh, they also gave battery historians so you can get a, much more data on what is happening with the battery, and you can find out what is breaking in the battery realm and make it better for your users. And then with Marshmallow, we have Doze, which puts your app into a deep sleep. Um, it promises to do about 20% performance improvement for your battery. Um, what it does is it basically shuts down network access and schedule jobs and other things that drain your battery. So now that we've explored the biggest technical challenges that you're going to have to think through, which are battery devices and networking data, um, let's talk about the glo how you can be a better global citizen when you're writing your applications. As we've seen, emerging markets are key to the growth of Android in the coming years. And Android is built on the openness uh, principle of openness, the ability for all people to change the system to meet their needs. This ethos should also be uh, spread to us developers. We should make the world a more accessible place for all of our users. I refer to this as globally inclusive coding. The first pillar of this is to realize that you are a global citizen. You are part of this world of its diversity and beauty, and you can affect it for the better. You can bring all your talents to the global stage. If you do something like write your app just for Europe or U.S. and then try to localize it later, it's really going to ha hamper your eventual growth, especially if you're talking about doing things like um, not making your app robust or efficient as possible right now. Oh, I'll make it work better later. That's not a great approach. Although there's many challenges to making apps for the whole world, you'll become a better person because you'll learn empathy, and you'll improve the global appeal of your application. 
realize that you have the power to influence your organization. If you don't get official buy-in from the higher-ups, you can still make changes yourself. You can still write a more efficient application. They're not going to fire you for that. What you can do is make all the changes that are under your power and then show them why it's so much better. That's called leadership. Take a stand for all your users and implement the best experience possible that you can. If you focus on serving all your needs instead of just the privileged few, you'll be better off and so will your users. In short, think globally when uh, creating your applications, but have the courage to stand up locally in your organizations. So you also need to realize, um, outside of becoming a global citizen, that you are not better than the other people that you are serving, that have fewer privileges than you in this world. If you think that your solutions are the best and everybody else should just be able to figure it out, you're going to have a hard time connecting with others in the world. Question your assumptions and step outside your comfort zone to better understand the needs of the global market. Another pillar is empathy. So you can't know everything. You have to accept that. Um, also, your experiences don't mirror everybody else in the world. You need to be able to take off your shoes and try on somebody else's. Luckily, empathy is a skill that you can actually learn when you practice it. So Chad Fowler, who is actually a Berliner as well, um, he has a blog out there about how to learn empathy. And some of the things I like from that blog was just make sure to actually listen intently when you're talking to someone. I listen pretty intently, but I also like to jump in and interrupt. So that's one thing that I need to work on to make myself a little bit easier to connect with others. But take an inter and sorry, take an interest in the world around you. Put down your phone. Talk to the person next to you on the subway or here at the conference. And then when you're talking about trying to see things from other people's perspectives, kind of take a third party observer sort of thing and think through different um, things that might be happening, especially if it's like conflict based or whatever. So you can see it from a different point of view. Getting closer to your users will um, lead to more empathy for what they experience. Seeing the world through other, for yourself is transformative, highly suggest it. Um, but if you can't travel, it's also important to take an interest in the world. You can go a long way towards understanding others. You can co connect with technologists in the regions that you want to serve or create uh, lab environments so that you can um, experience what your users are experiencing. On a more technical level, uh, we should make our apps as efficient as possible all the time. We should just do that. Efficiency should be our primary operating principle, not something you just bolt on later. You should think about efficiency in basically every aspect of your application. We can really improve performance in so many ways, and there's a lot of great talks at this conference that will show you how to do those sorts of things. I covered suggestions uh, around battery performance, data management, and tuning for actual devices. But there's a lot of other ways that you can affect that. So, in short, we've covered four principles to live by when you're serving emerging markets. They are be a better global citizen and bring your talents to the global stage. Have humility and realize that you're not better than your users. Have empathy for what your users experience and try to experience it for yourself. And finally, make your app as efficient as possible. When you truly value the user experience, you can create meaningful experiences that will impact billions of people. There are challenges, but these are things that we should be tackling. When we accept our place in the world, we can empower others to be more creative and interact with the global economy. You are giving them choices and exposure to a world of possibilities. For example, I met this little boy in Oaxaca, Mexico. He's too young for school, but him and the rest of the community have access to the computer labs after school. So this access to technology at such a young age is absolutely transformative. Do you remember what your early experiences were like? What would your life be without it right now? If you believe in access, and I do, taking on the challenges I've discussed here is absolutely um, wor well worth it to make your application accessible the world over. 
Now, this is just the beginning. Things are going to continue to evolve. Um, and as I mentioned, we're going to continue to grow in emerging markets. But your great reach is much greater than you ever imagined and will continue to expand. Android is a perfect vehicle to impact billions of people. Although you can't know ahead of time how, your impact, uh, how you will impact your users, but you know that you can make a positive impact one app and one person at a time. Thank you.